All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Ricky Telk here at the University of Florida. And uh, it is time for our next Society of Agriculture Communication Scholars webinar. Today, we have with us Kara Lawson and Laura Fisher talking about the, to the topic mentoring undergraduate researchers. So as we usually do this, uh, we'll have time for them to, to present. Uh, they can choose if you'd like to take questions during the process or at the end. That's up to you all. Just let us know. And then at the very end, uh, we have time for some question and answers, if that's uh, what y'all would like to do, as well as uh, announcements or anything else we'd like to share with the group at the end of the webinar. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Laura and to Kara. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Telg. This is a project and workshop that Kara and I are really passionate about. Both of us, as we've started our careers in the academy, we've really been working with a lot of undergraduate researchers. And we keep bringing up the question, how do we better serve our undergraduate students and our undergraduate researchers? So we are sharing some of our tips. We've also reached out to some of our faculty peers who um, weren't able to be with us today to get some of their tips as well. But we're going to be going through um, the process of what are the benefits of working with undergraduate researchers, looking at different strategies um, to onboard these students and to work with them during their time, and also some tips for what happens if it goes wrong. Dr. Lawson and I have designed this to be pretty interactive, and so there's lots of questions throughout, um, and we also are going to be sharing some goodies. Um, there's QR codes, so have your phones out if you want to scare some of the scan some of those and I'll also drop the Google link in the chat in just a second. But let's go ahead and get started. Um, the first thing that we wanted to focus on are what are the benefits of undergraduate researchers? And from our perspective as faculty, what I've learned is that this is such a great process to try out new ways to explain the research process. When I'm working with undergraduate students, these students have never touched research. They don't really know what it is. And so my first meetings with them are, let's talk about what research is, what are the things that you're interested in. Um, so it allows us to really focus on how can we explain things in different ways. Another great opportunity is the undergraduate students that I've worked with in the past, most of them are looking for um, a place in graduate school after they finish up their undergraduate career. And so this gives us a chance as graduate educators to start training our students to get them ready for the graduate projects. And this can also help us to lead projects and advance work when resources may be limited. Let's say we might not have enough funding to support a graduate student as a whole, but we want to start maybe with a smaller piece um, with our undergraduate students. So that helps us and might be a benefit for us. From the undergraduate research side, what we have found and what we have talked about with our students is they really see undergraduate research as being taking this research on a test run. This is our test to see, do we like research? We've kind of heard about this, but we really don't know what it is. Let's take it out and see what this is and if we like it and if we want to continue into graduate school. It helps us to really help them to try that scientific process. And a lot of times it's new and exciting. When our students start getting on it and they start figuring out what they're passionate about, they get excited about that research um, and trying that out. Another great benefit is when we're working with our undergraduate researchers, they might take something that they've done in class and they want to continue to expand upon a client or it might be a type of project that they've done and so they can apply that class content in a different way. Um, and they've also said that developing a new skill or research is that new skill. And so they gain this confidence in discussing topics. They're gaining um, these skills in working through different writing skills or analyzing data. And so this is another skill that they can add for their resume. So our first question for our team, just shout it out or raise your hand or put it in that chat box. But who do you think the undergraduate researcher is? Yeah, so when you think about who are these students, who are these students? Tell us a little bit about who the undergraduate researcher is. I experienced two of them. One is students that are really interested in asking questions and getting answers, and they're really high achievers. Others are students who needed extra hours more put in my undergraduate research course. Uh, and we have to work a little bit harder to get them through the process. But mm -hmm. most of my experience is twofold. Um, they're either super excited and really diligent about it, or they have no idea and they're learning as they go. 
Okay. Hey, thank you, Lacey. So are those students that you've had in your classes? Yeah. So all the undergraduate researchers I work with are students that are in our courses at some point in time currently. Yeah, that's a great way to identify undergraduate researchers, just the students that you have in your class. Um, Kelsey, I see your mics off. Yeah, I have, I've had 38 undergrad researchers my time here at Utah State. And I've gotten them from the journalism department uh, when I taught PR research methods and we had client-based projects and they turned into either papers or posters at the conclusion of the class and I've hired them. Uh, about 12 of them I've hired as undergrad researchers working for me under my agricultural experiment station project. And a lot of them are just interested in getting exposure to research, especially if they're interested in graduate school. And I position it as marketing and extension communications. And so if they're interested in county extension work or if they're interested in marketing, a lot of my local food work can be done that way and they're hired and work for me hourly. And then I've had honor students that need capstone projects, which are like the equivalent of a master's thesis here at Utah State University. Those are my high achievers. Those are my students that are wanting uh, not necessarily to go to grad school, but who are in the honors program and looking for a mentor that will guide them in two years over their capstone honors project. And then I will get some students through like extension internships where I do research and I'll hire them. And they're kind of just like exploring careers and they're not quite sure like that they want to do it for a job, but they, they know they have to do research-based um, evaluations and program evaluations and needs assessments, but they don't know what any of that is. And so I will mentor them maybe through a summer or spring semester. And I've kind of seen the gamut from journalism and marketing and animal science and ag ed and um, ag com and a lot of different majors where they're just kind of exploring what other research could they do that's not in a laboratory on our campus? Yeah, a lot of times they do. It's great to work with students from other majors. And Ricky mentioned honor students too. Um, Laura, let's show some of the participants that some of the students we've worked with too. So yeah, a lot of these you mentioned in your conversation here, the traditional undergraduate, which is the um, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, straight from high school that are taking your classes, engaged in your classes. Um, also, don't forget the adult learners too, um, especially those who may be taking your classes or completing their degrees from a distance. The adult learners can be really awesome undergraduate researchers too. Um, students from another major, was mentioned also the honor student and really any prospective graduate student. So these were just a few. We wanted to showcase the variety in undergraduate researcher potential that it's not just the students that we have every day in our class, um, but we can look so far beyond those those walls too. Okay, so we've some of this conversation has come up already, which I love. Um, you might be thinking, you know, I think undergraduate research would be really great and I could really use some help on getting some more posters done or maybe working on a paper or just some help with the lit review. But beyond kind of what we've talked about already, I'm, I'd love to know um, your perspectives. How do you go about finding undergraduate researchers? What have been some strategies that have worked in the past for finding undergraduate researchers? Hi, Dr. Lawson. Sorry for joining late. Uh, welcome. I uh, so I I know I just joined, but I because I don't have grad students yet since I've I've just started here at TSU. I um, I just started talking to students in my class and said, Hey, you know, I'm I'm looking for some undergraduate researchers. I know we haven't had agricultural communications as an option here. If that's something that, you know, the way I've talked about it in class, you think you might be interested in doing, you know, a, a poster abstract with me, doing some research with me could be a good way to, to dip your toe in before you fully change your major or, or do something like that. And so that's, that's kind of what I've done. I also, I had a student who 
she's not in my class, but would come by my office every day and say hi. And I just said, yep, you're going to work with me. <laughs> um, so I, the way I have found undergraduate researchers has just been talking to the students in my class and, and trying to get to know students here on campus. I will say we have a pretty robust undergraduate researcher program here. The dean pays for undergrads to work for faculty members and, and they get paid as undergraduate researchers as long as they have a certain GPA. So a lot of our students, as opposed to maybe some other institutions I've been at, a lot of our undergrads are at least more aware of research opportunities that they have. Yes, thank you so much. The classes are really your first big opportunity to look for those bright students who are curious about research. Thank you so much for sharing, Dr. Rockers. Um, did anyone else want to share strategies for finding undergraduate research that researchers that have worked for you? I've, always, yeah. oh, I've, I've gone to classes like other faculty classes where if I know there's like a marketing class or a social media class or a PR research methods class and I'm not the instructor, I'll ask if I could take like a few minutes and just advertise the position. Um, undergraduate research fairs. Mm -hmm. I have been pleasantly surprised on the turnout of that. I've gone a few years now um, before COVID and now I went back this year and we got some really good feedback. And a lot of people didn't realize that like, our faculty weren't doing that. And so, uh, or like they didn't, weren't familiar with social science research and they were thinking like laboratory research or vet science or animal science or nutrition science and they didn't know anything that we do. And so it kind of helped get out the word um, on what research we conduct and um, different questions you can study. And then um, we've done job boards. I don't know if you guys have to do it, but we have Aggie Handshake or Handshake Online and that works well. And then LinkedIn's worked really well for journalism. Uh, they'll look on there for positions. Wonderful. Thank you. Folly? Yes, for me, it has been through the honors program. So I had some students, I think, uh, last spring and yeah, some more this uh, summer, I mean, last summer and yeah, so mostly it has been through the honors program. So they just ask you to share your research uh, project uh, ideas or theme, and they have students sign up and that's how I get connected to the students. Fantastic, thanks, Paul. Yes, think about those honor students, just the nature of the honor student, very curious, engaged, active. Thank you so much, Folly and Ricky. Them, about uh, me finding them as opposed to them finding us. Uh, we don't have an undergraduate research course of any stretch, but we do have a lot of our undergrads who are honors students. And so um, every semester, those who qualify for a certain GPA, they get an email from me because I'm the undergraduate honors coordinator. And uh, we have a session to, to share uh, what does this mean uh, for you as an undergrad honors student? because they have to do a thesis, they have to do a full research project um, to receive highest uh, honors as an honor student. And so we've created a, a Canvas site um, that includes some videos of uh, researchers who would like to have uh, undergrads work with them. And uh, it works out very well. So it's kind of little testimonials from uh, current uh, professors, uh, researchers, as well as testimonials from past students who served and worked with uh, researchers too. So we need to do a better job saying we, uh, University of Florida, we need to do a better job of finding undergrad researchers as opposed to kind of them, them finding us. So. Yeah, it's, it's such a, a balance, Ricky. Thank you for sharing that. And it really is kind of both parties' responsibility to connect the mentor and the, the undergraduate research mentee. So Laura, let's share some more. Um, some additional things, and a lot of these you've already mentioned, undergraduate research mixers can be so beneficial. Um, for the students that I mentored at Oregon State, I met all of them virtually um, at undergraduate research mixers held either by the college or the university. Um, so it's a great opportunity. Typically, the 
the sponsor or host will have you put together a quick slide of your research. Um, students can talk with you afterward, connect, and it's it's been really helpful um, that way. The students who attend these kinds of events typically are very motivated and inspired to get connected and get to work. Um, Again, kind of a running theme here, engage the student in your classroom and classrooms. Talk about research opportunities. Have them look at different pieces of research. Give them a small research project as a class. Just kind of give them a taste of what it can be. And a lot of times that will um, increase the interest from some of your students. And then speaking of interest, it's so important to look for mutual interest, um, especially for us in agriculture and natural resources communication. How lucky are we to talk about a lot of different issues and the assignments that we give and the discussions we have in class are issues oriented and often there is some late there is some overlap with our research so if you notice a student that is really fascinated about um, water quality management or farm labor issues maybe have a further discussion with them if that's something that you're interested in um, just kind of talk to them about that because when you've got that mutual interest that's one of the tenets of a success successful undergraduate research experience. So just as important though, um, be careful not to try to force interest on a topic for either you or the student. Um, you know, if it's just not there, it's not there. And if there isn't something that you're both interested in exploring together, it's just not going to be as fun and probably not as productive either. Um, before we move on, does anybody have anything else about recruiting students that would like that they would like to share? Or I think we're good to move forward and feel free to keep using the chat as well. Um, so a little bit more about finding undergraduate researchers. Oh, yes. OK, so some other opportunities um, fun this. Actually, I think this was supposed to be funding undergraduate researchers. So maybe get an undergraduate researcher to check your slides for yourself. This one was totally on me. But campus programs definitely have funding opportunities. You know, when a student does undergraduate research, that's a job, um, you know, depending on what they are asked to do, that could be hours of work. Um, some programs that um, that Laura and I have used in the past and some other faculty from around the country, um, URSA Engage, which is an Oregon State program, shout out to Whitney, the Undergraduate Research Scholarship and Arts Program. So students can apply, get some funding. Um, True Scholars is a program at Tech. There's the Center for um, transformative undergraduate research experiences. Sometimes colleges or universities have support for beginning and continuing researchers. There can also be many grants from your college. Um, you could look at using some of your startup funds or funding from grants when it makes sense. And if we're looking beyond just the monetary option, uh, course credits can also be something that you could explore and talk about. So I think these are good options too, because I think it's only really fair to compensate your undergraduate researchers in some way. Okay, so just a little bit more on strategies to identify. We wanted to share some of the student perspectives. Um, Laura and I had some of our previous student researchers um, and some mentors in the field respond to these. So again, explore those research studies in class it can be fun to create a mock conference. Um, Dr. Moore said that he typically puts together a poster session for his students. And again, this just gives the students a great opportunity to kind of um, test the test out the waters as a researcher. Um, be vocal about that research opportunity in your class and with your graduate students. Um, sometimes your graduate students can help you to recruit these undergraduate researchers too. And as an added layer of benefit, I think a lot of times if you can incorporate the perspective of a graduate student in mentoring an undergrad, that's gonna be really helpful to the graduate student as well as they go out to the job market. And then finally, advertising is really important too. So advertise those research programs with the university and with the college, kind of like Dr. Tell said, kind of just do what you can to make that connection. So just a few um, other notes here. 
I feel like the trick to finding a great undergraduate researcher is just noticing that student who is really curious, who is really self-motivated. And typically the students with these kind of personalities and these kind of drives are going to make really good undergraduate researchers. Um, it's important to be selective because advising for research is a lot of work, right? We all know this. Um, it's a lift. But if the student is self-motivated and they do well in your classes, typically they do pretty well with the research process too. So I won't lie. I look for my brightest students. I look for the best writers. And typically they do really well with the process. Um, we also had some faculty share, look for students who are motivated to learn more and have some type of interest in grad school. So all of these kind of motivations in play, this is what we need to find. Um, also, it's okay to be selective. You don't need to invite just everyone in class. It can be something um, that you put some thought into, and it absolutely should, because the more engaged the student, the more progress you will see. Toss it back to Laura. Thanks. I keep skipping ahead on this PowerPoint. Um, so I'm going to take it from here. Um, Kara did a great job of talking about how we can connect with our undergraduate researchers, how we can do some funding with them. But the next question is, once we have them, what do we do now? And so we're going to work through what are some of those onboarding processes and how we can help them to do better. And this is our first time when we have some goodies to share with y'all. Um, what Kara and I have really talked about, and we've had some in-depth conversations about this, but how do we set the expectations so that both parties are on board and they're understanding what exactly we want to bring and what not only do we want to bring, but what each of us want to do. And so our first step and our first piece of advice is really make a plan of expectations of what's going to happen during this undergraduate research time. And so this example in particular, and there's many out there also, this is one that I've been using with my students. And so we make this agreement on what each party expects to bring to the table. And so as we look at this example, and I'm visiting with students, I talk about here are the things that you can expect from me. And these are the things that I'm going to expect from you in, in return. And some of it's answering your email, don't pushing me for edits before I can get them to you. And so I have specific guidelines on if you submit to me your poster abstract, you have this amount of time before I can give it back to you just because we all can't do everything immediately. And we need to have some communication on those expectations not only the day-to-day -day expectations, but really defining the goal. And so we've discussed things like undergraduate honors thesis to working to a poster or a paper submission. I have students that have just helped me on data collection, especially when I was at Kentucky. And so they would come in and help with some eye tracking research or help with some dial testing. And so really defining the goal and what each party is expecting during this time is really helpful on being clear with those students. Another point that we have really focused on is using deadlines to work backward to make sure that we know what is due. I know a lot of us probably just submitted to the next deadline. And I remember sitting down with one of my undergraduate researchers and saying, okay, we're working on this data. We have our data completed. This is the deadline for this conference. When do we need to have each of these components done for your research poster? And so we took that deadline and we worked backwards and filtered in pieces for edits and revising and making sure that our data was exactly the way we wanted it to be and the poster was exactly the way we wanted it to be. And so the biggest piece is remember, they're just like us, they need those deadlines and we have to be upfront with them about what they are. A lot of our undergraduate researchers are very busy. I know one of mine, she's all involved on campus, but she's also part of AFA. So she's traveling and we have to make really both of us to be sure, and it can't just be the deadline that I put on them, but working with them to make sure that it also agrees with their schedule. And so using those deadlines to help. Another piece of advice or a goodie is we need to focus on working with our students to help them to get what, what is research? What is this big beast? And a lot of times when we talk about research with them, they get this like deer in the headlight look. And so what we like to do is to break this down and talking about what exactly is that scientific process, that research process, how can we walk through what are the elements of a manuscript, selecting and defining a problem, et cetera. And so breaking each of those down. 
through this Google link um, or this QR code, you can find, I think there are two examples. One is from Kara and one is from Taylor Roof, Roof of syllabi that they have used in their classes or their independent study to walk them through what exactly that research process is. And so walking them through how exactly to write those research questions and objectives. How are we gonna analyze that data? How do we need to report the results? What do we need to put in our conclusions? And so using those credit hours or that paid time kind of as a class and working them through that process. Another really helpful tip that I've worked with, not only with my undergraduate students, but also with my graduate students is I help them to create an outline for their projects. And I do this with my research. And so my students have told me that they found this really helpful, that they're not just starting to go into the rabbit hole of research, trying to find literature, but what are those key points that we need to look for, or they need to look for as they're going through the literature? Or what are the key aspects of the data that we need to work through? And so outlines um, really provide a guide for us as faculty to communicate what the student needs to accomplish. And by working with them in that collaborative journey or that collaborative mindset helps us to pinpoint and get them in that direction that they need. As we've mentioned, um, undergraduate researchers, sometimes this is their first time and what has become second nature to us of going to the Journal of Applied Communications or um, another journal that you go to a lot, our students don't know that. And so make sure that you're telling them what journals do you need to pinpoint? What should they program, should they explore? Where else should they go can be really helpful. Another aspect from this is sharing tools. And so I've started to create on my own end is just a running doc and I keep Microsoft Teams and I put this information in there. And so for example, for APA, sometimes when I'm working with undergraduate researchers, this might be the first time that they've ever used APA. And so giving them those resources and places to go to learn these steps and strategies. So like I found these YouTube videos that do a great job of explaining APA. And so one of our first things are when we start working on posters, I say, hey guys, let's go to this YouTube video and you can watch this on your own time. It's only about two minutes long and look at what that process is. And then we can mimic that with that. So my advice is give them the tools that they can be then be used um, to be successful in those step-by-step -step instructions on how to run stats or do APA um, and what are those components. Another piece of advice that both Kara and I have talked about is keeping it real and being candid about the pace of research. And so we put this quote up here that says, what do you mean the introduction and literature review will probably take the most time and it'll probably take a really long time. Um, I was talking to one of my undergraduate researchers last week when she was doing her final edits on her poster and she goes, I never knew how long it would take to write one page. And I'm like, I know, but that's part of that process and being consistent with encouragement, being patient with them um, as they might take longer than they ever anticipated to do one of those. And it's not because they're not working, it's that they're learning this for the first time and it's a completely new way of thinking. So kind of that idea of keeping it in mind, budget time, and as we're working with these deadlines, make sure to add in a lot of padding to those deadlines for that intro and lit review or back end of edits, being patient, allow them to come for questions and constructive criticism. Um, I'm in a unique place where my office is, but I can see directly into our master's office. And actually one of my undergraduate researchers, she sits at that front desk. And so she knows when my door is open and she'll like peek in and she goes, do you have time for a question? And I'm like, all right, let's talk or, hey, let's schedule a meeting instead or ask me on Teams and they'll chat with me on Teams about it. But being question, or being patient and allowing the, that time for those questions and constructive criticism is really key. Another piece is being adaptable. Not all students are the same. So be willing to adjust strategies that work for one student um, to help them grow. For example, one of my undergraduate researchers, uh, she is really keen on stats and she's like, I'm, she hasn't taken a stats course rather than her undergraduate stats course, but as we're explaining it, as we're going through it, she's really grasping that. Whereas my other one, she's probably a little bit more of a qualitative researcher than a quantitative, but we've had to adapt and I've had to learn how to adapt how I'm explaining those types of questions and those deals with her. 
from our um, different faculty that we've talked to, what our experts and our students said is some of the things we've already touched base about, but using online modules and providing examples. So for example, Dr. Tell has already said, we have this Canvas shell that we're able to put details on. I use Teams for that, um, providing them with examples. And so I have a folder that says example poster narratives, and I can share that with my students so that they can see what are they getting into? What are they starting to write? Um, we look at determining student interests and meet them where they are, uh, hosting meetings weekly and in groups. I know a couple of weeks ago, right before those next deadlines with my undergraduate students and my graduate students, I said, hey, let's have like this little lunch and learn. And a group of us got together and talked about what's the poster um, deadlines for next? What are they expecting and going through that process? And that saved a lot of time for me instead of working with I have a lot of them because I have Dr. Myers' students right now, but instead of working with all eight to 10 of them, I was able to meet with them all at once to work and talk through those. Um, and working through those goals, providing those weekly deadlines, those have been really helpful. So my question for y'all is what are some tips that you all have when working with undergraduate students and training them about this process? Or tips for onboarding? It's not necessarily onboarding, but I think the most helpful thing that I have seen working with undergraduate students is I have a giant whiteboard in my office and we draw out a lot of things. We draw out an outline, but we also draw through like, how is that big scope of like lots of, of big ideas getting down to one point? And we do it kind of in the boxes and arrows format. And it really has helped them make those connections. And then they can get up and actually draw things and, and be engaged in what we're talking about. Um, so it's just really helpful to have a, a space where it's visual for them instead of just only talking about it kind of in this um, verbal format where they have to kind of picture it themselves. That's been probably the most valuable tool in walking my students through these different steps. That's a great example. Thank you, Lacey. Polly, I see your hand up. Yeah, for me, what I've seen work is, first of all, starting by identifying their passion, what are they passionate about and kind of like trying to take back to the research that I'm working on. So for all the students I've worked with, I've discovered that once they feel like it's something that they want to do, they get on board much easily. So the only thing that I have to be responsible for is just to guide them, but giving them that authority, that opportunity to just ask them to say, what are you passionate about and what are the issues that you kind of feel you want to research on and tie it back to my research area, that really works. Yeah, finding their interests, that is such a key. And then uh, Kelsey, I see your hand up. I think for me, something that's really helped is discussing how we want to do feedback. And I will break apart a poster by sections or paper into sections. And then I'll we'll work on a deadline for that section. And then we'll I'll give them feedback. But it's about really constructive feedback. And it's not just about things that need to uh, be improved, but it's also finding all those glows to give them some confidence that they're doing things really well and that you like how something's being said or what they're doing. And I think that's so critical early in the process because it can be easy, I think, for us as researchers to, I think, look for gaps, look for other things that need to be talked about in the literature review or the wording of an objective that could be improved. But we always have to step back and just remember that if this is their first chance doing it, they're gonna maybe need to have some praise for things that they're doing really well. And then I talk a little bit about how to take that feedback and to realize that's not personal. And it's nothing about them as an individual or something that they did wrong. It's nothing like that, right? And sometimes you look at it and you see everything that you still got to do and they'll just kind of look almost deflated because, but it's like, well, wait, look at everything you did that was so amazing. Here's the next step and here's what we're going to dive into. And let's brainstorm sources to go for this and journals to find and places to seek out that research. And then I don't think they feel like it's as difficult. Because they can look back at it and kind of see those iterative processes. And, and I'll be honest, sometimes I've shared my own work mm -hmm. from the past, especially when I worked for Courtney and Emily as a graduate student. And then when I was an undergrad researcher and show them that like every one of us goes through this and that we're all going to have feedback that um, will make us better. And I don't think they take it as personal 
uh, and they can feel like they can grow from it. Absolutely. Positive reinforcement is such a key, especially with working these undergraduate students and my students. I've typically had my undergraduate researchers in class, but I always use this phrase of you're not your work. You are a valuable human being. And when they get feedback back, I make them say that out loud. And then we go through and talk about what are the good things that they did. And then it's not that you did bad. It's that we can expand on this or we can dive deeper into something. Those are both great examples. Um, does anybody else have anything else that they want to add here? Okay. All right. So the last piece that we wanted to focus on is I have the strategies. However, it's not going so well. So now what? And I'll turn it over to Kara. Thanks, Laura. And it's not going so well. Like we've given you all of these QR codes and tools and you've got the smartest and brightest students. Nothing can go wrong, right? I wish that was the case. Unfortunately, sometimes things just don't go as planned. And there are some things that you can do to kind of move forward from that. So um, yeah, per, actually that's that was one question for the for the group, Laura. Have you ever had a research project with an undergraduate student not go as planned? And I'd love for you to kind of sit and reflect on this for a second. And if you have a story um, to share, I'd, I'd love to hear it, but I, I'll be happy to share with share a story um, of a project that just didn't go quite right because it happens. You know, we often see the rewards of undergraduate research. Those are very public. You know, it's a presentation at a conference. It's a journal article, maybe. It's something that says, ah, this is why we do undergraduate research. But unfortunately, it just doesn't go that way all the time. Um, I worked with an undergraduate student who was so interested in doing research. Um, she was in a couple of my classes. She was very curious about research. She talked to me multiple times about doing a project. Um, so I agreed to take her on as a mentor. Um, I agreed to take her on as an undergraduate researcher. And from almost the beginning, there was so much curiosity and so much passion about an issue that she wanted to explore that it had a lot of potential, but I just could never really work with her to get her focused enough to move forward. Um, you know, we all know that doing research is maybe a crumb of an entire pie. Like one research project is probably even less than one crumb of an entire pie. And I just couldn't get her to move beyond um, that. She wanted to accomplish so much more. And because we could never get the research question um, clarified in a way that she felt comfortable, unfortunately, the project never went really anywhere. Um, she did collect data, which was great, but, you know, I just felt like metaphorically I couldn't get her unstuck. From She was stuck in the mud like a tire continuously spinning. She was producing, but it was really um, not in a way that we could advance the project. So unfortunately, um, we the term ended and she had some family things unfolding as well. Um, so I just recognized that it was important for her at that time to kind of focus on her family and the door is always open should she want to return to it. But sometimes stuff happens and um, I think it's important to just recognize when you both need to kind of move forward. So <sighs> It's always a bummer to talk about that story, but it happens. And I think that's a reason why, too, you need to be just so selective about picking the right undergraduate researchers and just treating each research experience as a different one, because they definitely are not all the same. Does in, have, Did anybody ever have any problems with undergraduate researchers that you maybe did move forward? My story was kind of a negative one in that the resolution was that we just ended the the research project a little prematurely and and that's okay because it allowed me to free back my time um to work on some other things that were moving forward anybody want to share <laughs> i've had more negative than positive <laughs> and to the real thank you the, Dr. Rollback. Yes. yeah to the point that i don't seek out undergraduate researchers if somebody approaches me and wants to do a project then we'll absolutely do a project, but otherwise, and I think it's, 
me and not them. I think it's the way that I have stuff set up or, or not set up on the beginning side of things. But yeah, I, I don't think I've done a good job of guiding them through the process and therefore it hasn't been a good process for anybody. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that because we've given you all the highlights and benefits of undergraduate researchers of working with them. But I do think it's important too to acknowledge that, you know, it's not always a surefire awesome thing. But let's take a look at the next slide, Laura. So there are so many things that you can do to move forward from a roadblock. And I think it's similar to any other project, but there are some things that you should definitely remind yourself of first that the students are undergraduates and that this is a learning process. You've got to kind of manage your expectations and it really just depends on the students and remind yourself that neither of you have to do this. Um, this isn't something that's required of you as a faculty member, and it's definitely um, not required of the student to work with you. And sometimes it just takes having a hard conversation of, is this really what you want to be working on? And like for me, you know, with the student that I mentioned um, just a moment ago, we were ultimately working toward a poster. And I found that the time that we were spending trying to get that accomplished and the lack of progress just actually just didn't it, it wasn't it couldn't be a priority anymore just because there were too many other things that I needed to be working on but that being said you can sometimes get unstuck by using those external opportunities and goals so if you're working toward a conference submission I find that's a really inspiring thing for the students to do because then there's a hard deadline and it's not just some ambiguous you know it gets finished when it gets finished but a conference deadline can be really helpful um, also using regular meetings as check-ins so making sure that you set clear goals every time you meet with your student on okay Today, you have given me one paragraph of the literature review. Next time, I want you to make these updates and I want you to expand on X theory. So just give really clear goals and when necessary, get more hands on um, as your time allows. And then just obviously the third bullet there, I think is probably the most important just to realize that every undergraduate experience will look a little different. I mean, perhaps for me, I became a little bit spoiled because the first undergraduate researcher I I worked with was so successful. Um, he was an adult learner. He was an excellent writer. He came prepared to meetings. The, the progress just advanced so naturally. So with that, I was like, yeah, this is awesome. Like, and it was awesome. But then, you know, a couple of terms later, it wasn't so great. So just remember that every undergraduate research experience will look a little bit different. And I think it's okay to kind of have your approach to mentoring, but just kind of recognize the student's role in that and be prepared to adapt. So really that's all we had for today. Um, Laura and I are so grateful that all of you attended today and we would love to have any questions or comments that we have about undergraduate research or undergraduate research. So it can be hard, but it can be super rewarding too. So what questions and comments do we have from our audience? Uh, Nesma? Hello, thank you so much for your great presentation. Uh, well, I do have a uh, quick questions regarding when you shared at the beginning that sharing with the students, the research process. But actually, I'm curious, because I'm a new postdoc at Virginia Tech, and probably for the next semester, I'm going to lead that initiative. And I'm curious, to what extent should I go deeper for, with them in terms of, you know, the research process? Because sometimes it's complicated. So how should I approach that to, like, giving them a knowledge and at the time not like pressure them with like a heavy duties to do that mm -hmm. yeah that's a great question question I, I mean I, I'll kind of answer first and I'll be curious to hear Laura's feedback and some of our other um, participants feedback as well but I think one way to approach it 
is to just simply have a conversation about the purpose of research first and foremost. And I actually pull out the chart that I think every student in our discipline has seen with those ends met with like the little bar graph. Um, I think it's in the folder. If not, I'll be happy to drop it in. But just talking with the students about the purpose of research and trying to set those expectations early, just about how much they will be able to accomplish here. And that was the problem with my student the project that didn't work out she she was so passionate and it was just way too big picture though so trying to get your students to focus in early on what they want to explore and let them know early that they're going to be accomplishing just one small piece of the puzzle um, but but I like to approach it from the purpose of research and then kind of build from there um, Laura what what are your thoughts on that one so most of my undergraduate researchers, I've had them come to me and say, hey, I have this great idea for a project, and that's happened for one or two, and the other ones say, hey, I'm interested in research, how can I get involved? And so they're really helping with a small piece of it, such as data collection, or I say, hey, we just ran this public opinion study, let's talk about this small piece, or what are you interested from this, and we walk through it. So I think my answer to this is, it depends on what they're doing. So when I was working with one who started a project from the ground up, and it's taken, I've been very patient, it's taken a very long time to work through this project, we went through like, what is the purpose of research? And then from like a research method, we only focused on that one specific method. So she's doing a content analysis, okay? And so we talk about what does a com content analysis do? What does that provide? And I don't even talk about qualitative. I don't talk about experimental design with her. It is only focused on her content analysis because that's what she's doing. So I think it depends on the scope of the project, what those students are going to be doing and focusing and narrowing with them on the specific items that they're going to be doing. Like when I'm working with the ones with public opinion, I, we talk about what public opinion is and we talk about what this panel did and all the others, but I say, okay, this is the very narrow scope that you have picked out and focusing solely on that. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, and just experiment. I mean, yeah. be prepared to adapt and if something's taking a lot longer to explain than you thought, just kind of go with it until, until you're ready to move forward. But thanks yeah. for that great question. Anybody else questions or comments? I have a question. Hi, I want to thank you all for the presentation um, and resources. But um, it sounds like different formats are available for undergraduate researchers. So it sounds like there's a, like an individual line where there's the mentoring and you know some either financial or course credit. But if they are in a course credit, are you finding you're doing with them in groups? Like, do you ever combine your undergraduate researchers in group work? And how do you manage that group work, pro you know, like that side of things? Um, so just one of y'all's um, experiences by that. I guess I can go first. So mm -hmm. yes and no. And again, this is a depends, but my two undergraduate researchers were helping with data collection for a, a dial testing study. And then they both selected different variables from this to write a poster on. Um, and so when I worked with them in group, it was more, what is this type of research? What does it look like? Going through the study with them, explaining the purpose of it. And so the general conversation I did in group, and then we split when we were working on their different research questions from that. So there was a little bit of both, but they didn't edit each other's work or anything. That might be an idea for the future that might've saved me some time. Yeah, and if you find yourself repeating a lot of the same information, which you will, if you're meeting with students individually, just kind of take note on that and think about how you could better structure your time and the students' time to kind of meet together for those big picture things. But yeah, my um, structure was similar to Laura's in that I would, I mean, to explain a variable, you there's no reason you wouldn't be meeting in a group for that. And just some of those high level research 101. Um, but yeah, for like their specific projects, I find it's a little bit easier to meet individually as well, um, just so you can get into the kind of nitty gritty details of the project. Kelsey, I see your hand up. 
Yeah, I taught PR research methods for four years here at Utah State University, and every semester I had about 20 to 24 journalism majors, and I had a client-based project where they had a marketing problem or a PR problem, and then we tackled, like, what was going to be the purpose of the project, and what were the objectives or goal, like, what could they study, and I had the groups individually, like, work on that one individual research uh, goal, or reporting of those objectives, but like we had instrumentation development, we like broke it apart, who was going to develop what section of the instrument, and we got feedback from the client, and the groups met with me individually, and I was able to publish off of every one of those publications and projects and work with the clients, um, either posters or papers, and so I think a lot of it depends on how you want to set up the course, and, uh, and I had course peer feedback and review, and they got to have time to have sections of the report uh, reviewed and given feedback on, and then they got to like report on a specific objective and the outcomes and recommendations that they could give to the client for that work. So they had a little bit of ownership that was just unique to them for it, but it worked out like where they got to have a taste of research, but they got to look at like the big picture. How would you do it as a team? How would you conquer a problem and research it and learn to work um, and be able to report that data back to uh, your client and decide how they're going to use it? And we did presentations and little posters and the client would come and engage with them and faculty would come and listen and ask questions and give feedback to them. And we just made it a really immersive, like hands-on experience where we had some setbacks, we might have some failures, we might have some great glows that happened at that time and they all learned from that experience since it was in the classroom thank you well i realize we only have five minutes left and i saw dr Telg's face going out his clock like this so i will i think we need to turn it over to dr Telg. <laughs> of course i am no i was looking at yes i was looking at my clock but i was i was gonna say <laughs> we're about five minutes out thank you laura uh, do there's any other questions? We have time for maybe one more question or comment. About this. Well, join me in thanking Laura and Kara for a very nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, gave us gave us some good ideas about uh, engaging uh, undergrad researchers there, which is not the same as the next topic for our our webinar, which is November twenty eighth, uh, which is the Monday after Thanksgiving. Chris Boone will be talking about onboarding our students for engagement. That will be the last one for the calendar year. We miss or skip uh, December. We'll pick back up again in January. So uh, we do have a few minutes if people would like to, to share any, um, any announcements, anything going on at your universities or anything along those, along those lines. For professional organizations, since we're not technically a professional organization, we're an association of scholars. So if you have anything from your professional organizations that you'd like to announce, this would be the time to do so as well. Alyssa? Um, so I, if you don't know who I am, I'm Alyssa Rockers. I just started as an assistant professor at Tennessee State University. We're in 1890 land grant in Nashville. Um, if you have any students that are, are possibly interested in going to grad school, um, and are looking for a unique experience. We don't have the established master's and PhD program that a lot of your institutions do, but I do have funding for graduate students and I'm looking particularly for master's and PhD students to help with building the curriculum and, and building our, our new ag comm program. So that is something, you know, we, we maybe don't have the established graduate courses that they'll get somewhere else, but they will get the experience of helping me build this program. So if you have any students who might be interested, um, my email is just arockers at tnstate.edu. Um, so send them my way if, if you think they could be a good fit. Great, thank you, Alyssa. Anyone else? Well, I have one quick announcement if no one else does. And again, picking off of what Alyssa said, it is so encouraging to see so many young in terms of uh, where you are in your program, uh, faculty, uh, starting new programs or, or adding your expertise to, to programs that are uh, beginning. So again, kudos to everybody there. 
it's great to see how things have, have changed and how we've grown as a discipline. I wanted to give everybody an update for the uh, NACS uh, submissions. Uh, I don't have all of the information for professional development or the posters. Those I think are due, we're just due Friday, but the paper submissions for those of you who are old timers, you know, we were, we were thought we would be happy to have like 20 submissions there. We had 38 full paper submissions, 38 full paper submissions to, to NACS for this coming um, February, which is almost well, way, way more than we've ever had before, full papers, which is great. So um, thank you all for those of you who are on the call here who said that you would review. And if you have not said yes, there'll be probably an opportunity for you to review posters. So please reach out to Ashton McLeod Morin about that because we are in need for, for reviewers, which again, review because it's a blessing because of the growth in our discipline. So kind of keep it that way too. So it's our way of giving back to, to help uh, all of us uh, grow as a discipline too. So with that, unless there's anything else, again, thank you all very much for your time today. We'll see each other in a month and have a great, great Monday. Bye.